Good morning and welcome to Armanino's webinar, The ABCs of BCP, Business Continuity Planning. And I want to let everyone on the line know that you will receive an email within three business days to get, an act, to get access to your certificate of completion for CE and also a link to the slides so you can have um, access to the slides after the webinar. So first, I'd like to uh, introduce myself. My name is Mary Tressel, Director of Marketing here for our consulting department at Armanino, and uh, welcome you all. And I wanted to remind you how to use your webinar pane. So in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see an orange arrow. If you'd like to send in a question throughout the webinar, just click on that orange arrow and the box will expand. You can type in your question for our staff and as time allows, at the end of the webinar, we will answer those questions. Additionally, you want to make sure that your audio settings are set correctly. If you have called in on your telephone, make sure you click that dial, that little button. If you're using your computer mic and speakers, select that button. This helps to eliminate the echo sound that may happen if you have the wrong audio setting selected. To remind everyone on the call, to qualify for California CE, you must be using a personal computer and log in with your own information and unique URL. You must be logged into our online software for at least 50 consecutive minutes within the scheduled time frame of the webinar. We need you to actively respond to at least 75% of the polling questions and then complete the evaluation survey at the end of the webinar. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters. The first is Jeremy Suharski. He's a partner in our governance, risk, and compliance practice, and he has over 13 years of experience in audit support, internal audit, and process optimization. He's a proud graduate of Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, and uh, he definitely helps companies optimize their compliance programs. He takes a very uh, kind of practical approach to make sure that the controls and processes have the proper balance between the need to protect the company, uh, but not be unduly onerous and restrict your ability to innovate. Our second presenter, presenter is Steve Schaffner, a senior manager in our governance risk and compliance practice. He has more than 17 years of governance risk and compliance experience, and I assume he's also a very proud graduate of UC Berkeley. <laughs> he is, um, performed various types of IT governance, risk and compliance audits, including financial statement audits, SSAE 16 and SOC attestations, disaster recovery and business continuity planning, risk assessments, SOX compliance audits, security controls testings, and a variety of others. During our webinar today, you will learn how to identify the difference between business continuity planning and disaster recovery planning. You will, uh, we will enumerate the steps that you can take to implement a disaster recovery plan and we'll uh, give you this, the tools that you need to ensure successful deployment and maintenance of that disaster recovery plan. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Steve. Hi, everybody. I'm glad you joined the call. Um, today, we're going to talk uh, about the points on the screen here. So just to run through those really quickly, we're going to define what disasters are and that might be a little eye-opening for some. Talk about why we want to plan for them. What is the planning approach? And in that, we'll talk about uh, cloud considerations, which is certainly a direction a lot of companies are taking these days. Uh, we'll follow that with testing and continuous improvement and talk a little bit at the end about trends and audit considerations. So here we go. First, let's define disasters. Um, usually when most people think about disasters, they think about the, the items in the left column here, which are natural disasters. That's your earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, et cetera. Um, but there's also man-made and technological types of things that could impact your business. At the end of the day, it really comes down to anything that interrupts your business for any reason. And really, as you're doing the planning, you need to think about what all those different types of things are. Um, as you do that, you don't need to always think about large calamitous events like an earthquake as we're showing on the right. That's what we here in California think mostly about. Uh, the picture in the middle of this also shows a fire that was just in one server closet at one client. Um, that, that event took them out just as much as an earthquake taking the building out. So you need to think about uh, smaller events as well. And then the, the picture on the left, if you're not familiar with 
hardware, that's the inside of a, a disk drive. If you have one disk drive that has critical data on it and it dies on you all of a sudden, that takes down your system just as much as the earthquake or the fire or, or riot or anything else. So let's talk about why to plan. And I will hand off to Jeremy Sukowski. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. And, uh, you know, echo similar comments that, that Steve began with. I appreciate everybody carving time out of their day to spend some time with us and hopefully take some good tidbits away that they can take back to their organizations about you know, the importance of disaster recovery and business continuity planning and really thinking proactively about how you uh, how you mitigate against uh, uh, against some of these uh, these issues or, or outcomes that can come along with having, you know, unplanned outages, et cetera. You know, and, and piggybacking off of what Steve had just said on the last couple slides, where he's talking about, uh, you know, the, the sort of varying degrees of, of outages that you could uh, you could occur. It's it's so common that when we, we work with clients to help them implement a disaster recovery plan, that they immediately think of worst case scenario. Hey, we've got an earthquake, plane crashes into the building, et cetera. Um, but what you'll see here is really at the end of the day, the, the leading causes of of unplanned system outages um, are, are far more benign um, than some some uh, you know act of God, if you will. Uh, top three causes: uh, first and foremost, system upgrades and patching. If you think about just what goes into keeping your you know maybe your Windows laptop running, you know you've got all these different hardware components that also run software by the the various manufacturers. And then Windows sits on top of that. Then all of these other applications made by various vendors sit on top of that. Um, and applying uh, a new patch or an upgrade to any one of these systems can have adverse effects. Um, and we've seen this with organizations we've worked with. Uh, as uh, you know, they have scheduled downtime, they take the systems down, they apply a new patch, and they can't get the systems back up in a, a timely and orderly fashion. You know, power failures um, or, or issues such as that, uh, PG&E inadvertently cutting through uh, a power cable or you know, construction uh, you know, uh, severing uh, either your network cable, your power lines, et cetera. And then, you know, Steve obviously showed the picture too, you know, fire, um, you know, these uh, modern modern servers throw off a boatload of heat and it is in a very concentrated space. So it's not uncommon that we uh, that we see fire being really a, a, a key contributor to, to unplanned outages there as well. You know, and as we think about this, you know, from an unplanned uh, outage perspective, we see what the top three uh, three, three items are here. But let's uh, shift gears slightly, and let's talk about what, uh, with our first polling question, what uh, what the potential impact could be. Great, we're going to just launch that for the audience to see. So, the question to all of you, and you can just put uh, your, your opinion here. What is the average cost of an unplanned outage? Is it A, $11,200, B, $52,500, C, $104,350? These are very specific numbers. <laughs> very specific. And D, $287,000. So there's been a study and uh, they've come up with an average. And so we're asking each of you to kind of weigh in and, and what you think that cost would be for an unplanned outage at your business. And it's like um, half of the people have read the study because there is one strong leader in the answers. <laughs> We're going to give just a couple more seconds for people to weigh in. We've got about 90% of the folks have voted. Um, all right. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and close the poll. So the audience answer uh, was, and C, they went with C, mm -hmm. but the correct answer yeah, the, the correct answer based on a, a study that was performed was 287,000. So I find it interesting that actually one of the lowest uh, responses was for the largest dollar amount here. Um, and it's relatively straightforward. If you think about your business, trying to quantify it, uh, what your what your total impact would be from an outage, you know, and just if you were to take the accounting industry, you know, we did this internally, you know, years ago, we quantified by department, by team, what the expected outage would be based on, you know, the number of hours we would normally charge, what our average bill rates are, et cetera. You know, but if you're in a manufacturing business or, you know, not-for-profit, et cetera, you can start to quantify based on kind of the key drivers of your business, uh, you know, what that impact is going to be. So definitely something, you know, that that we share this in part to kind of open, open people's eyes to say this is something you should be thinking about and it really is critical to the long-term success of your business. 
So you know, different drivers for having a business continuity plan, you know, making sure that data is ultimately available. You know, we joke that with a lot of organizations, uh, whenever they lose an IT system and the data uh, that's resident therein, it's sort of like lemmings um, or, or uh, meerkats sticking their heads out of their little holes. You know, people standing up in their cubes, all of a sudden all the heads start popping up, you know, and asking questions. Hey, can you get to this, uh, this data? No, I can't. What about you? Um, so really making sure that that data and those systems are available because they are critical to uh, to the organization. Uh, a lot of the times we see regulatory requirements driving this, um, whether it be uh, you know customer contracts, um, specific regulators, um, whether you know if you're in, in banking or telecommunications or payment card processing. There's a lot of regulations that drive the need for having robust disaster recovery and business continuity plans. You know, as I mentioned, you could have a contractual obligation. With, uh, with customers, we see this quite a bit with smaller organization, organizations as they're ramping and taking, uh, taking their business upstream to larger and larger clients, especially in the cloud space. We see this as, as a contractual obligation that they ultimately have to meet. And last but not least, it just makes good business sense. Um, you know, it, it comes back to the, the, the age old uh, adage, which was uh, a pound of, what is it? A pound of, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, you know, putting in that effort up front, having the playbook, knowing how you're going to recover is so much easier and a smarter investment than having the scramble of trying to figure out how you get back up uh, and running without having that playbook. There we go. I was just waiting for the slide to advance there. Um, you know, just some other statistics to think about. You know, we've, we've kind of thrown some numbers at you already this morning. You know, just a few more, you know, recent study show that you know 71% of companies have some form of disaster recovery or business continuity plan, um, which is great to see. You know About three quarters of companies out there have something. Um, the middle statistic here, 59% uh, indicated was last updated within the last year. And then the last one, 82% were tested in, in the last year. I will say those actually, based on my experience, seem to be relatively high. Um, you know, most organizations that we work with, we'll see them go through the exercise once. And then to be honest, the disaster recovery plan kind of sits on the shelf and collects dust unless they're being proactive about testing it. Um, so in my experience, those are those two are higher, but it also could be the makeup of the individuals, uh, the companies that were included in the survey. Uh, larger enterprises tend to have uh, have more diligence around updating their plan. Uh, organizations that are in the cloud space or have um, more uh, robust regulatory or contractual obligations tend to test more. So it very much could be based on the makeup of that as well. Steve, what are your thoughts? No, I, I agree. I, I think these stats seem a little bit high. Uh, and I think the, the key might be on, on the left stat here. It's talking specifically about disaster recovery or business resumption. Um, and that's one component of the larger business continuity planning pie, if you will. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. But if you consider that piece, and then the second and the third stats here are based off of the first one. So if they had a plan, then 59% were updated and 82 were tested. Uh, I think this paints a picture that might be a little rosier than, uh, than what we're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Now with that said, we wanna make sure that everyone's staying awake and staying engaged here. So let's go ahead and uh, kick off our next poll. Thank you, we're gonna just launch that for everyone. So what percentage of companies without a BCP, a business continuity plan, go out of business after a disaster? Again, we're just asking for your best guess here. Is that under 10%, 25 to 30%, 50 to 60%, or over 90%? So, and again, this is probably something that people don't think about a lot. What, what, what are the after impacts once your company has gone through a disaster? So we're gonna leave that open for just a couple more seconds. Looks like we've got most of the audience has voted. All right, Brian, so let's close that poll and we'll share what the audience thought and then share the correct answer. So looks like, Jeremy, that people think between 25 to 60% of businesses go out after a disaster. Exactly, you know, if you look at it, we've got what, almost 70% of the responses concentrated into, into the two, middle there, you know, 25 to 30 or 50 to 60%. So not necessarily surprised in that respect that we're seeing sort of the bell curve, but the reality is, uh, you know, organizations that can't recover within five days will go out of business in one year. Um, and so it, it is a very significant number. So having the proper investment uh, in, uh, 
in your BCP, in your uh, disaster recovery plan, thinking through what are the critical pieces of your business will help you avoid becoming, you know, the next statistic, you know, and this one, again, I think a lot of the, the numbers and the statistics that we let off with here really just kind of raise awareness and sort of hopefully capture some of that attention because this is something that, that should not be viewed as a sort of routine or, or, you know, we'll get to it when we can type of activity. This really is critical to the long-term success of your organization. I think this really uh, hopefully will help to drive that home. Great. So we've talked about why you should be doing these things and talked about, you know, sort of the need and the, the downside if you don't do it well. So let's start getting into the nuts and bolts of how do you go about doing the actual planning? Thanks, Jeremy. So <clears throat> moving down that path, the first thing to be aware of is, is a little bit of terminology. And this is what I was referring to on one of the polling questions earlier or sorry, one of the slides earlier. When uh, people talk about business continuity plans, they, they mix these two terms on the screen together, business continuity and disaster recovery. And there are two halves of the same coin, if you want to look at it that way. Disaster recovery is the actual recovery of your normal operations, right? So if the data center burns down, we need to get a new data center, fill it with new equipment and get it set up and running. So that's one whole set of activities. But while that's happening, if your systems are down and you need it for your business, then you need to have an alternate plan in place. That's the continuity piece. So there are, there are two complementary sets of actions that need to be happening at the same time. Um, most people lump these together and they'll call them business continuity plans or BCP. And I think that's okay. But as you're getting into your actual planning for your organization, uh, understanding the distinction between these two becomes more important in how you uh, set up your teams and how you set up your plans. So the next slide here is talking about common fallacies in doing the planning. A lot of companies think of this as a one-time event, that we're gonna go through this planning process and yay, we've got our document, we're done, put it on the shelf and, and go away. And the activity can be executed in a vacuum, meaning you have a core group or core team of people that put it together and they, again, they get it done and they put it on the shelf. It never gets communicated to the organization, nobody else knows about it. Uh, and obviously that would not be a very effective plan if uh, everybody should be aware of it. A lot of times it's only focused on IT systems and that happens largely because IT, uh, you know, the, the skill and the discipline that IT brings to an organization in order to support the organization is often the same skills and, and abilities that you need for business continuity planning. It's basically breaking down each business unit to understand what are the inputs? What do they do with those inputs and where are the outputs? And that's very much the planning process when you're doing your business continuity plan. Um, the BCP is not an absolute assurance that you're covered. And as we get deeper into the slides, you're gonna see that uh, you can drive yourself crazy trying to plan for every possible thing and maybe that's not the best use of resource. Uh, there's also disaster recovery planning versus the BCP, sometimes that's left out. And a lot of companies only focus on large disasters. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the check marks. So these are the good things we want to see, that business continuity planning is an ongoing process. It's part of your company culture. Everyone's aware of it. It has, again, a basic level of awareness. Uh, there's a basis for reasonable assurance of recovery. You have a process to mitigate risks that would prevent recovery. And you're covering all your critical company processes, so anything that's key. So how do we get there? A, a healthy business continuity program, which is that function that accomplishes those on an ongoing basis, looks something like this. Uh, you wanna start with by doing a risk assessment. And this is a little different than a, a enterprise risk assessment or you know, there's different types of risk assessments that we do. This one is specifically looking at how things could impact your business. Uh, I've also seen in a lot of the business continuity plans that we review it on when we're wearing our auditor hats, where this is called a threat assessment. Um, once you identify what are the things that it could impact us, and for example, here in California, it's earthquakes, not so much hurricanes, right? That type of thing. Uh, once you have those identified, then you do a business impact analysis. And that's basically where you say, if those things impact us, what is the impact to our business and how that impacts our customers? With that knowledge, then you can design a solution that's the creation of the plan in the first year, and then you implement the plan. Now we're at the bottom of this circle here. Once it's implemented, then you wanna test it and evaluate if it's actually accomplishing the goal. 
Based upon what you learn, you revise the plan, and now you're back at the top of the circle again. What uh, most uh, regulations and standards that require business continuity, what they expect is to see this cycle happen at least once a year. And we see most companies do it once a year. Yep, absolutely. I think that's really the critical piece is, and the way you let off, Steve, was by describing it as a program. It's not a one-time effort. It has to be something that is cyclical, that you continually reevaluate where your threats and your risks are because your business will evolve. It should be evolving uh, over the course of, uh, of a given time period. So now that we've talked about the process, let's start diving into each of these uh, rectangles here in a little more detail. The first one is doing a risk assessment. So we already had this slide up there when we talked about the types of disasters that could impact you. And that's basically what, what that risk assessment is, is you get this list and there's certainly other ones that uh, are available online and, and we have a pretty exhaustive one that we use. And you go through and you say earthquakes for California, check. Floods, uh, depending on where you are, yes. Hurricanes, not so much. Drought, yeah, in California we have those. Twisters, not so much. So you kind of run through this list and you think about the types of things that could impact you. And that's definitely step number one. Um, I'm looking at my uh, cheat sheet in front of me. So it looks like next up we have a polling question before we go deeper. So let me tee that one up. All right. And I'll give it back to Mary. Great. And the question for all of you is how many types of disasters should most companies plan to include in their planning efforts? Under two, four to six, six to eight, over 10, and none of the above. So we want to give you a couple of minutes to think about that and think about the impact of those different types of disasters on your company. Um, and let you give an answer there. Again, I think we're looking for your best guess. Mm -hmm. This is not a test not, that you have to get right. Yeah, not right or wrong. It's just basically making sure you're still there and paying attention. You're right. And it also is a good uh, a teaser for the next topic we're going to cover. Okay, so it looks like we've got the majority of folks who have voted, and the, the answers do range, so we'll share your answers and then give you the correct answer. Yeah. So it looks like most of the respondents uh, came in with B through D. So 35 percent, four through six, 26 percent with C at six and eight and 33 percent with over 10. Um, the right answer is actually E, none of the above. So four percent of you. Awesome job. You are the uh, the the A students, the A students. Saw yes, through so that shit. The bell curve. Yes. Yes. Working out. Um, and the next slide kind of gives the, the moral to that story and the reason why we threw that question out there. A very common pitfall for lots of companies when they start creating a BCP is that they come up with a plan to respond to an earthquake. And then they come up with another plan to respond to a flood and another one for the next and another one for the next. And really, it doesn't matter what that disaster is, whether it's the earthquake or the fire in your, your uh, server room or if it's a hard drive burning out what you should be planning for is the absence of your critical resources, regardless of what causes it. So in order to plan, you do need to have some idea of the types of things that could impact you, but that's mainly just to get a gauge on, would that take out my building or would that just take out a room or would that take out, you know, one location versus another? Um, that kind of helps you gauge what level of planning you need to do and what the response should be. So once you've done your risk assessment and you've identified the types of things that could impact you, now we're going to look at how it impacts you from a business perspective. And so um, as we alluded to before, and why does IT often get the task of creating these? They uh, look at each business unit to identify its inputs, what process it does, and its outputs. And then when you layer onto that from a business continuity perspective, what are the key resources that that business unit uses to perform whatever the process is. Uh, so you're looking at uh, dependent resources, the things and people or departments that they need, uh, any other dependent processes that feed into that. And then also you should be looking at what are the peak periods of the year. Uh, a lot of companies get really busy at year end with a holiday season or just rounding out the whatever it is they do and putting their books together and closing out all those types of things. Uh, so if a disaster hits you during those periods, that's obviously a bigger impact than if it hits you during your slow season. Um, and then as you're evaluating all this, you want to request supporting data throughout. So 
the more data you can use to drive this, the better off you'll be in, with the result. The whole outcome of the whole business impact analysis exercise is to identify and prioritize your business units and figure out, you know, we have a limited number of business continuity dollars to invest this year. I can't cover everything. So what should I focus on first? What's my highest priority? And the key statistics that help us drive that, which is an output of this exercise, is the recovery time objective and the recovery point objective. The recovery time objective, that's basically saying how much, how long can I go before I need to be back up and running, before things get really bad and, and there's a different category of impact to my business. So by that I mean if you're down for a day or two, your customer, customers are frustrated, but you know they can live with it. If you're down for a week, now they're getting really loud and they're talking to you and it's talk about you need to get back up and running or else. And then there's a period of time, let's say a month later, where now they're so ticked off they're going to your competitors, right? So that type of mindset feeds into both of these, but with the RTO, usually you wanna have things back up and running within that two or three day time frame uh, in the scenario that I'm painting here. The RPO is a little bit different, and frankly, in all of the business continuity world, this is the hardest concept to communicate. This is the amount of data that you can tolerate losing. So what that means is, if we're down and we can't do whatever our service is, how long can we go before we can't even recover? It's We are just not recoverable in a normal sense. Um, the other way that companies often look at this is, how much can we tolerate losing? And they tend to think of it from their customer's perspective. So if you're a data-driven business, uh, you know, and you're hosting systems on behalf of your customers or something like that, how much data can they tolerate losing again before they look to leave? So those, those are the key objectives of the business impact analysis, to look at each department, identify its RTO and RPO, and you can drop that into a spreadsheet, sort it, and that helps you target where to invest your planning. So that leads nicely into the question of how much is enough. So this graph kind of helps pictorially lay that out. On the x-axis here, we have the length of downtime or the absence of the critical resource. So it's a factor of time. And on the y-axis, we have dollars. This first line here, the red line, this represents the loss related to a disaster. So on the left-hand side, of, if we're down for a minute, people are probably going to blink, not, you know, scratch their head a little bit and keep going. If we're down for a day, there's a certain level of impact to the company measured in dollars. And obviously, the farther out you go, that's, that line grows exponentially. So you can see that visually here. The other interesting thing is you'll notice the line does not connect to the y-axis because for most companies, if you're down for a minute or five minutes or an hour, you know, it's again, people scratch their heads. These things happen. Systems aren't always available. You know, people are out for lunch, come back later. That's not a huge deal. So oftentimes a sh brief outage is, is not going to impact the business. But then again, the farther out you go, the more expensive it gets. Now we layer in the green line. So this one's a little trickier to wrap your head around. What this is saying is, is whatever your tolerance is as an organization regarding downtime, you can invest money to reach that level of downtime. So on the left-hand side, if you are a SaaS-based company, you provide a system online to your customers, if it's down, well, now you're not delivering your service to your customer, and that's obviously bad. Now, you can prevent that downtime, but there's a huge cost. If, if your tolerance is two minutes, there's a whole lot of investment in high availability architecture, redundancy, just all kinds of things you can do to ensure that doesn't happen, but that's at a high cost. The more downtime you can live with, you can see that line grows exponentially smaller. If your customers can live with two months or six months worth of downtime, the cost to be able to maintain that level of delivery is very low. So when you chart this out, and, and there's a bit of a science to this, and you can sit down and think about the buckets I said before, in terms of if we're down for a minute, people blink. If we're down for an hour, they're frustrated or a couple of days. There were some lines that get drawn that, that trigger a different response from your customers. If you just think in that mindset and kind of plot a few points, you can chart this out for yourself kind of on the back of an envelope. The whole ex the exercise is entirely designed to find where these two lines intersect. And that should be the level of planning that you want to do on an ongoing basis. Because at that point, 
you are going to spend that much money. It's either going to be in loss from the disaster or it's going to be in mitigation of that disaster. Either way, you're going to spend that much, so you may as well be proactive. All right. So now, once you've done those pieces, now we get into the actual planning, and, and the next few slides are assuming that you don't have anything in place now. So you want to start off by creating what, what some people call the umbrella plan. It's that thing that applies no matter what type of disaster it is, uh, how it affects the company. You need to have these pieces in place. And it starts by formally defining the roles and responsibilities. Who's in charge of this thing? And that uh, oftentimes is defining the disaster management team. Those are typically your, your C-level executives, usually somebody from legal, usually somebody from marketing, HR, facilities. It's top people related to how impacts disasters could impact you. And what those people do is, is the next bullet, the third bullet with all the sub-bullets here. They're responsible to look at the event, formally declare the disaster, and then they establish what I call a command and control structure. So with that, they get together as a team, they do a damage assessment. Um, what can we salvage? What can we not salvage? They kick off both the recovery and the continuity processes. Remember, those are two halves of the whole. And uh, at the back end of the whole effort, there's a resumption at the primary site. They formally declare an end of the disaster. And then we do a post-mortem, learn our lessons, and we uh, update everything based on that. that. That team is also responsible for the ongoing testing and maintenance of the plan. So the, the key on this slide, I think, is just being aware that there is a, a management team and the, the formal declaration of the disaster and the, the formal declaration of the end of the disaster, that's kind of like when, um, whenever there's a big natural disaster and you, you always see in the news that the president flies in and, you know, they took a helicopter tour, saw what was going on, and they formally declare a disaster. What that does in that scenario is it opens up FEMA funds to help address the relief efforts. And this should be the same within your organization. When this team of executives formally declares a disaster scenario, that kicks off a different level of response and procedures and funds that aren't uh, normally there day to day. So that is key when you're putting the umbrella piece together. You know, and as you drill down a little bit from the umbrella piece, you know, as, as Steve described, you know, the umbrella really is that that highest level. Um, from there, you need to drill down and, and consider recovery strategies whether it be on a sort of product uh, product basis or team basis or potentially a geographic basis if uh, your, your BIA showed that those recovery strategies need to be a little bit different. So you want to go through and you want to evaluate what are your, your options for both you know, primary and secondary recovery. You know, are you going to look at doing sort of the classic hot site, cold site uh, where you have uh, you know, equipment and physical facilities available to you? Are you going to uh, look at cloud solutions? Um, you can have reciprocal agreements, and this one was really interesting to me. Early in my career, um, I worked for uh, worked at Visa for about a year and a half doing uh, internal audit work, and when we took a tour of their East Coast data center, the first thing you see as you walk into their network operations center is a giant machine sitting out on the, the raised floor with a giant MasterCard logo on it. And they have reciprocal agreements where in the event of a disaster, MasterCard will fail over to Visa's network as a secondary or tertiary option. So thinking about what are those reciprocal agreements, I, I, I would say in the cloud environment we operate in today, I wouldn't expect to see some of those um, as much. You know, I think hot and, and, and sort of warm and cold sites to a certain degree are, are uh, becoming you know, less and less popular and reciprocal agreements, et cetera, being less popular, but cloud really being uh, a, great, a great alternative where at the end of the day, you really, if you put everything in the cloud and you have a very minimal footprint from uh, an internal IT perspective, you know, at that point, now you're maintaining bandwidth and, and power to your facility, and then everything else resides in the cloud. So from a recovery perspective, it's, uh, it's very, very elastic, very adaptable. And most cloud providers, part of the advantage of going there is they have these availability zones. So they already have this geographic redundancy built in as a service that they offer to you. And a lot of companies take advantage of that. So that, that's kind of why the hot, warm, cold stuff and the other things you mentioned are being less prevalent these days. Yep, absolutely. And all that evaluation, again, goes into defining what your approach is going to be. Again, whether it be by geography, by vertical, by product, et cetera, you define what the recovery, recovery approach is. You know, you have your team that gets formed um, that reports up through the command and control structure. You document and communicate what that plan is. 
um, relatively straightforward. It's, you know, planning um, just like any other type of planning activity you would go through for any other piece of your business. And really what you want to make sure is you're, you're evaluating what are the, the people, process, and technology that has to go into the execution of this plan. And the piece to really not lose sight of is that this really needs to be viewed also as a training and education opportunity. Uh, because while you may not be called on to execute this plan very often, you want to make sure that it stays fresh in people's minds so they know, uh, at least at a basic level, once a, a disaster is declared, that they understand exactly what they should be uh, what they should be doing, or at a minimum, what documentation they should be pulling, so they have the game plan. You know, so as we shift gears slightly here and we think less about the DR piece and more around the business continuity considerations, you know, how do we make sure we've got uh, the ability to uh, continue operations in the absence of critical resources. Um, you know, evaluating what are alternative work locations. Again, it comes back to the cloud in a lot of respects. The cloud's great. You need inter an internet connection. So if the building is inaccessible, um, you know, do we have the ability to, to have people work from home? Uh, can they, you know, work offline? Do they need to be connected? Um, you know, a lot of cases, um, there's quite a bit of work that can be done without uh, accessing corporate systems. Uh, you know, in the case where you need to have a recovery location, has that been identified? Has it been evaluated? You know, considering business interruption insurance uh, to offset some of the costs you may be, uh, may be incurring. Um, and again, evaluating your re recovery priority. Uh, do we need to have this applied to everybody or is it only for one specific team? You know, the rest of the company, go home and wait for the call. Um, you know, a lot of different things like that. And that helps to define, um, in a lot of respects, what are your, what are your critical uh, processes? You know, communication process. How do we let everybody know where they should be? Uh, when I worked for the federal government, um, it was not too long after the Oklahoma City bombing. And one of the things that we went through was uh, was enterprise-wide uh, continuity training. And a piece of that was understanding what the communication process was. And on the back of our badges, this is, you know, pre-mobile phone, obviously, pre-cloud <laughs> pre, uh, technologies. On the back of our access badges, we had a 1-800 number. And it was in the event of any type of emergency that was either announced or you saw through general media, you would call that number and it would have instructions waiting for you. So what is that communication process? How are you going to make sure it's available in the absence of your communication systems, whether it be email or phone, et cetera? What are the response procedures? You know, what one thing that a lot of companies fail to think about, what about a pay policy? What happens if we uh, if we can't continue operations or if we're down for more than more than a two week uh, two week period? Are we going to go ahead and continue to pay people? And, and what does that emergency pay process look like? Because just because there was an earthquake doesn't mean that uh, I don't have to pay taxes or, uh, or pay my mortgage. So I'm um, thinking about those things. And again, this can then also filter down to, to department recovery plans because not all pieces of your business are created equal. There may be some that are necessary. They may, there may be other pieces that can work either offline or ultimately are less important and can wait a longer period of time before recovery is achieved. So now we'll talk a little bit about um, cloud apps and, and how that's changing things. So just to compare and contrast, in a brick and mortar world, if you're a little mom and pop shop and your system goes down, um, you can still continue the operations while somebody's fixing the system. You just get out a paper receipt book and you start you know, writing everything down the old fashioned way. Um, and then you can catch up when the systems get, are back online and get all those transactions into your systems. In a cloud environment, though, it's a little bit different. Um, the move to the cloud is certainly growing. Uh, I'll zip through this pretty quick because I think most people are aware of this already. But um, it, used, it started initially with websites. So some companies would have their websites hosted by uh, a third party outside of their network environment, and that was the extent of cloud. And then what we saw is payroll and HR systems we're moving to the cloud. And actually right now, uh, as we're talking, what we're seeing is a lot of companies moving their ERP systems to the cloud. And there's you know others that are probably not behind. The, that's what we're showing with manufacturing, shipping, receiving, and whatever the, your other business functions are. It, it's absolutely conceivable that you would move every all your IT things into the cloud. You, in the core of your business, in the product that you make or the, the service you provide, that's your expertise. It's not always IT. So why would you want to be an IT shop any more than you would want to be a landlord of the building that you're probably leasing? All right. Leave those to the professionals that focus on those. Let your team focus on what your company does. So moving to the cloud is good, but it brings some different twists in from a BCP perspective. So when you're looking at cloud service providers, um, 
there's a few different categories here in, that this slide shows. There's infrastructure as a service, that's what those acronyms are at the top of these three uh, columns here. Infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Uh, the infrastructure is basically just the, the vendor gives you a virtual server and you put your own stuff on it, you manage it, off you go. Platform as, as a service is that plus a little bit more. Um, they provide a little bit more value, but usually not the software. You have to add that yourself. And then software as a service is what you most often see where you sign up for the cloud, they provide you your ERP system, for example. They manage it, you just use it. Uh, what this graph represents is the, the more to the right you are, the more reliance you have on the vendor uh, whereas on the left-hand side, if they're just providing you that virtual server, you have to maintain it yourself. Then there's a lot more uh, work that you need to be thinking about from a business continuity perspective. So that has to be part of your planning evaluation. Um, other things to consider when you move to the cloud is if you have your organization, you're going through a network to get your cloud service provider. If the provider is down, waiting for the slides to catch up here, if they're down, that's obviously bad. They're down and, and you can't use their service. But likewise, if the network is down, I'll let the slides catch up here, there we go. If the network is down, you are just as down as if the cloud provider was down. So you, you have to consider that as well. It's not just the provider being available that's gonna impact you, it's all the pieces in between. If you have platform as a service or infrastructure as a service, your business continuity strategy might be to have two of these vendors so that if one of them goes down or the network, you have an alternate that you can switch your load over to and you can uh, continue delivering your service. And I'm just gonna click through this real quick. I think this is just elaborating on the point I was making. Alternatively, if you have a SaaS solution, right? So this is where you're just a user of the system, they do everything. If the network or they are down, I'm letting the slides catch up here, again, you're just as down. When you get to business continuity planning and what is your strategy, um, you've got all of your eggs in one basket. So you need to really focus your attention in that scenario on uh, choosing wisely with your vendor and making sure that they have business continuity uh, in place and that there is an independent assessment of that that you can rely on to make sure that they're gonna be available when you need them. All right, and then a final thought on the cloud service providers. Oftentimes you'll go to a cloud service provider and what you may or may not know is they provide the software that you're using but then they're also using another vendor to host the servers, much the same as, as you're outsourcing, they're outsourcing that level of it. Um, and then there may be additional pieces in here where uh, they have call centers that are hosted by other third parties or software that's developed by other third parties. So again, in the same logic, if any of these links go down, that could impact you and you need to consider all that in your planning process. So just to summarize cloud considerations, um, if you're in infrastructure or platform as a service, Plan some redundancy, have more than one vendor that you can go to, or balance that between your data center that you still maintain on site if you choose to do that, and a vendor, but have an alternate in case they go down. If you've contracted with software as a service where you're just the user, uh, again, understand the vendor's environment, um, look at their disaster recovery or business continuity plan pieces, and there's the colored text in here. You need to beware a little bit because often when you review their agreements, there'll be a service level agreement in there, and that sounds great. They have that, that five nines of uptime, 99.999%. But if you look down below in the, the legal stuff, it also talks about a force majeure clause or an acts of God clause. And that's outside of that service level agreement. So don't be uh, fooled to think when you see those five nines, it's like, okay, they must have disaster recovery nailed. Um, no, they've left themselves an out. If a disaster hits them, they might be down for a very long time. So uh, you also need to ask about the BCP part in addition to the service level agreement. And then obviously make sure that there is ongoing compliance. Uh, they, they as a provider to, to you should have a service organization controls report. For those of you who aren't as familiar, if, if you remember the SAS 70s, that's a, a earlier flavor of the same type of thing. 
but make sure that's there and if either way you might want to also make sure you have an audit clause in the agreement that allows you to evaluate their their whole operation BCP and and otherwise and make sure there's penalties if they don't uh, meet their obligations to you back to you sir yeah and, and a lot of this here that that you'll see uh, we've covered covered in some level and you know, it's really just to reinforce some of the things that Steve had mentioned in in his update in his discussion points you know the key thing is is as you're thinking about the considerations whether it be for you know disaster recovery or or continue you know con uh, continuity of operations you got to be thinking about key staff and or vendors not being available and you want to make that make plans for you know primary secondary etc and make sure that you've got decision making authority um, parked with each of those uh, individuals or with each uh, with with each entity and thinking about communications and infrastructure, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, making sure it's not contingent solely on your corporate systems. You know, if your systems go down and you're reliant on email for communication, well, you might not be able to get that communication out. So do you need to be thinking about uh, a different way to get that message out to your team, et cetera? And then, of course, having an escalation plan and what the related timelines are. And that ties back into what you're going to define as part of your umbrella, uh, umbrella plan. And Steve had described it as kind of the command and control. What are we doing at the top to make sure that we have the right ownership and accountability to make sure that we are declaring a disaster and seeing it through to completion, including root cause analysis. You know, other things to think about, um, your recovery procedures should have a reasonably strong level of detail. So an individual with, uh, you know, the right skills, knowledge, and experience, while they may not be um, directly responsible for that process day to day, if they've got the right skills, knowledge, and experience, they should be able to pick up that plan and execute if need be. Um, and thinking about, you know, how do we recover all or a subset of those systems? Do we have different tiers? You know, tier one systems are recovered in one hour, tier two are recovered in one day, tier three, and we'll get to it when we get to it. You know, so how do we, how do we make sure that we have the appropriate process to recover in the right cadence, et cetera? Thinking about performance, just because it's available doesn't mean it's going to be firing on all cylinders. You know, I can get the car to the uh, limping along to, so I can make it to the mechanic. You know, think of it through through that lens. Okay. And potentially not having a full set of functionality as well. Yeah, it might be a few seconds between clicks where it's normally yeah. very responsive. Exactly. We're talking about systems. Yeah. So we've talked about building out the plan. Now let's talk about testing it, making it better. So there's a few different types of tests, and, and you should, you know, if you remember that, that circle of activities we want to do annually, you want to make sure you do at least one of these every year. Um, is, if you look at the sub-bullets here, we range from tabletop testing to a full recovery exercise, and those are the two ends of the continuum. The tabletop testing is a lighter version. We like it because it doesn't impact customers. It's mainly getting the key executives, you know, that disaster team together at a table in a conference room and you have somebody prepare a disaster that, that's going to evolve throughout a, a series of slides or a series of envelopes you pass out to people and, and everybody opens something at different points and, and gets their customized uh, information. What that is good is for testing the command and control structure, the decision making, and for building awareness. So it is a valuable exercise for those reasons. But really what you want to get to as an organization is that last sub-bullet where you do a full recovery and the, the extreme example, and I've never seen a company do this, but when you walk into most data centers, there's a big red button on the wall, and that's a, a power off switch, just in case there's a, a life and safety issue that's going on and you need to do that. If you were to theoretically hit that switch and take the systems down, that would fully test your recovery capabilities because everything is instantly gone. Um, obviously, that would be very disruptive to your customers to have their systems go down all of a sudden or to your your organization if that's what the systems are supporting. So most companies pick something in the middle here and you can see there's that the crisis command team call out testing you can uh, kind of do a tabletop flavor but have people in their different locations and test that way. You can do targeted failover testing and the next couple sub bullets kind of relate to that. So we can pick one application and fail it from data center A to data center B or that type of thing. One test or sorry one application or one business unit and just test those and then over time we can rotate through all the important ones. So those are the different test strategies and you want to um, lean towards the bottom. Most of the regulators want to see that you're doing a robust test and you're actually testing uh, actual you know, legs and arms and whatnot doing what needs to be done.
And then, of course, no matter what testing you do for, on the last bullet here, you want to make sure that you're debriefing, doing a postmortem. What can we learn? How can we make things better? Because that's the whole point. So I like this one. Um, it, it's kind of highlighting much of the same information, but this is just a great Dilbert. <laughs> our, our disaster recovery plan says something like this. Help, help. What do we do? Well, hopefully we'll have the budget one day. You should probably move the slide over by that graph. Yep. That there is, we go. <laughs> that's good information. And I think that takes us to our next polling question. All right, and this is our final polling question. And I do want to remind you um, that you can use uh, this time as we're pulling it up to send in questions to our presenters. If you have specific questions about BCP or disaster recovery plans, you can certainly uh, send those in to Jeremy and Steve. And if we run out of time at the end of the webinar, they will respond to you um, by email after the webinar. So our last question here is, for companies that do not test their BCP or DRP, what is the most commonly reported reason? Are they afraid of a disruption to their customers, disruption to their employees? Uh, they're not sure if they have availability of the resources and budget to test. Um, they they uh, lack those resources and time. And then they lack the technology to do the testing. So <clears throat> again, we're looking to try and determine um, what the most commonly reported reason for non-testing is. And so we've got uh, about the majority of you um, voting in. I do want to let everyone know we will be sending out um, within 48 hours or three days after this webinar a copy, a link to all of the slides um, and the recording of the webinar plus your continuing education certificate. So with that, let's close the poll. It looks like you've got some smart cookies in the audience. Today. Yeah, we had a 64% response and answer D, which is a lack of resources and time. And, and that is the correct answer. Uh, the thing to note of, of all the options available, those are valid options. And we see clients, uh, when we talk about testing, they're always talking about the disruption of the customers or employees, uh, the, the resources necessary, all those things are valid. But that lack of resources and time is the main reason. And here you can see uh, this is kind of the, the results of a survey where we got that from. So they're all kind of neck and neck other than that last piece there. All righty. So let's talk about some trends. Um, BCPs are the number two area of increased IT spending. We saw this in a, a recent study. Um, and it's an increased focus at the C-suite. Uh, so I think really it's that shift towards the cloud that we talked about earlier um, as part of that, and people are getting a little more concerned about what do we do if we have our eggs in one basket. If we're relying on that to run our business and it's gone, what do we do? Uh, it's, it's part of that whole, you know, when you give away the, uh, the function, you're always also giving away the control that comes with it, and I think that makes people nervous. But also, you have your own contractual requirements with your customers, and so if you don't have that control, this becomes a much more important thing. Also, I know in some industries, financial services, uh, insurance, healthcare, the, the importance of these systems can have dramatic impacts, not only to your business, but we have a, a couple of customers where if they go down, they impact the U.S. economy. And so obviously it's a much more important thing and regulators are requiring this. So there's a lot more attention on that and I'm sure that's what's driving the, the study results there. Yeah, absolutely, Steve, and I think you hit the nail on the head, and it really ties back to everything that we're talking about here, and, and I, I like that your picture, you, uh, you've lost a little bit of hair. I was here. just going to say, sorry, I stole uh, your thunder there. No, 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 absolutely, but no, I think this ties back into everything that we've been discussing today as well, which is, you know, we, we talked about the importance of the cloud and, and how most organizations have, uh, have moved on to, you know, a cloud environment, and Focusing on BCP, I think, is a piece that comes along with that. You know, you're transferring the risk from yourself to a third-party organization, and you need to be able to manage that and not just simply, you know, close your eyes and assume that it's going to be okay. Um, so this absolutely ties in. I think the other piece we're seeing as well is it's starting to integrate with other corporate initiatives around enterprise risk assessment, enterprise risk management, et cetera. BCP absolutely is becoming a topic that we're seeing at the board level. You know, and the last thing to, to, to cover very briefly is audit considerations. And I'm just going to knock through this very quickly. You can see the various considerations here. Um, Steve talked with, uh, about them uh, in, in, in a great level of detail as we talked about how do you build out the right plan, how do you test it, et cetera. So we're not going to belabor the point. But, you know, this, is, this can be used as a reference to be thinking about, 
if you're going to be audited, um, whether it be from a regulatory perspective, uh, financial audit, internal audit perspective, thinking about how you have the right artifacts come out of your process. And these are a lot of the things that you would ultimately need. Um, you know, around the design of your process, around how you uh, implemented it, how you tested it, et cetera. Um, some additional resources for you, um, because everybody loves reading more about business continuity planning, become subject matter experts in the area. I do all the time. Absolutely. I read, I, <laughs> I read these uh, organizations' materials all the time. It's actually a fan, these are, are um, some organizations that actually have some fantastic resources you can tap into as you look to ramp up your BCP efforts. You know, so let's bring it full circle here and leave some time for questions. You know, we've covered all of the different things you can think of here. You know, business continuity versus disaster recovery planning. How do you implement it? How do you test it? Um, and then really what are the benefits and then what are some of those emerging trends? Now, with that said, we did leave some time for questions. So as Mary mentioned, if you have questions, please be sure to submit them. Yeah, so we have uh, one that's come in so far. It says, are there different BCP plans for different types of businesses? And do we have templates that we can share? They're looking for plans specific to schools. And, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is we do have templates that we use, but every single one of them, I mean, there's a high degree of customization. If you can imagine the different types of industries, uh, the different size of companies, the different types of responses. So e even if you are a similar type of organization to another one, um, just for example, the way that one organization sets up their active directory and has that distributed across sites and whatnot uh, is going to be different to another company that also uses active directory and also has multiple sites but they've chosen a different way of responding to that and and there's different team members and different process so I mean we can I, I can give a template but to be honest it, it would be so generic I don't know that it would add a lot of value but uh, but I, I don't know if you want to add to that Jerry. yeah I would but I would say we can absolutely provide some examples and things of that sort. Obviously, to Steve's point, it's going to need to be customized. Um, but it will be, I would say, it'll be a good starting point. Um, instead of start pulling out a blank sheet of paper and trying to figure yeah. this out as you go, it will give you a starting point to think about threat analysis and business impact analysis, et cetera. You know, all of the components we talked about, um, you know, can be translated to, uh, to an organization such as, uh, you know, uh, a school, et cetera. Yeah, and I, I think the most uh, benefit out of a template would be the command and control structure. It's a whole, how do we form, how do we declare a disaster, yeah. how do we communicate? Communication, absolutely. Those parts certainly are common. Yeah, so another good question that's come in, and I think we can round out um, for the presentation day, is what advice can you get for uh, gaining the support of the C-suite personnel? If you're working in an organization where they kind of ignore the needs of IT, um, what, how, do you, how do you get them to pay attention to this issue? You know, this is one that I would say, you know, gaining C-suite support, um, you know, look for the internal champion, even if you can't get the entire C-suite on board, figure out who the one individual is in that, in that group uh, of individuals that you could potentially gain support, and have them help to champion your cause. Alternatively, the other piece that I've seen be very effective is having uh, an open and uh, honest dialogue with your board as well, because I will tell you, um, I've, I've seen a lot of times where management will sort of not turn a blind eye to it, but, but reduce the severity of it. And then it comes to a board discussion and the tune changes very quickly where the audit committee wants to understand what is management doing to mitigate this risk. And they're asking the right questions um, to help protect the organization. Yeah, I would layer on two thoughts. One is what you're just saying. You know, business continuity planning distracts people from their day jobs, whatever that is. And so if you don't have that support from the top, you're not going to have a successful business continuity planning Anything. effort. Yeah, you're, you're just not going to get traction. It's not going to get done. But in terms of how do you get the C-suite engaged if they're not already, uh, we have a lot of success starting with clients by starting with that tabletop test that we talked about. And you'd be surprised if you take something as simple as what if we have a power outage and how that impacts you? What if it's the middle of summer and it's hot? That building's going to get hot. Where are you going to meet? You thought it was going to be in a conference room, but it's 110 in there. You don't want to be there. And, hey, what happened to, to Sally or Johnny? You know, nobody's seen them in an hour or two. Should we send out a search party? Should we notify their family? Uh, wait a minute. The power's out. That affected the water treatment plants. So the water coming out of the spigot is now brown. Do, what do we do about that? I mean, there's all these cascading effects that something very simple can have. And when you really put it in front of the C-suite and you say, look, you're in charge. What are you going to do? Make a decision. Um, 
it makes them realize that it'd be good to spend a moment or two and plan ahead of those events and have the right response. All right. Well, thank you both, Jeremy and Steve, for sharing all these thoughts with you. We did get a couple more questions, so we'll make sure that um, we get email responses out to the audience on those. And uh, if you alternatively would like to directly email Jeremy or Steve, um, you may do that. And also Jeremy's email can be just Jeremy S, which is a little bit easier to spell. So if you slightly, <laughs> unless, unless you're familiar with Polish last name. <laughs> um, so we appreciate everyone joining us for today's webinar. Thank you. And again, we will be in touch in a couple of days with a link to the slides and your completion um, certificate for your CE. So have a great day. Thank you.